This is Salma Schimmel at the 2011 annual ASCO meeting in Chicago. And we are beginning our interviews with many of the most prominent key opinion leaders so we can bring you first-hand information directly from the source. I'm so happy to be able to welcome you now. Professor and Honorary Consultant in Medical Oncology, Dr. Christopher Twelves. Hello, Hello, Dr. Twelves. Nice to meet you. You are also the Head of Experimental Cancer Medicine at the St. James Institute of Oncology in Leeds, which is in the United Kingdom. That's right, that's right. And you're a very important uh, guy because you have been the principal investigator of a study that really is changing the face of breast cancer for women that are living with metastatic disease. And I say living with because I think that's such an important distinction. Now, I think one of the uh, important things that, I, that I've been very focused on over the many years I've been treating women with breast cancer uh, is just that group of women you, de you described, the women uh, whose cancer has relapsed. Uh, but uh, who we want to help live for as long as we possibly can and to maintain their lifestyle. And we see quite understandably so much focus on adjuvant therapy because of the potential to cure the disease. Uh, and that's uh, quite right and appropriate. But there are many women, unfortunately, for whom the cancer does come back. And I think it's important we don't lose sight of those women and how we can help them. So let's talk a bit about your research and what is so distinguishing about it as compared to some of the other therapies. And again, we're talking about women with metastatic breast cancer. Well, the, the study that you're uh, talking about and that I presented at last year's ASCO uh, is with a, a new drug called aribulin or halivan, as it will be known. And this is a new type of chemotherapy drug and it's one that originates uh, rather interestingly from a marine organism, from a sea sponge. And this was discovered oh, literally decades ago uh, from a sea sponge that was uh, found on the seabed near Tokyo. And the scientists uh, took extracts from this sea sponge and discovered that uh, one of them was quite toxic or very toxic to cancer cells. How, how does a scientist, you find the sea sponge, but how does a scientist begin to put the pieces together and realize that toxic nature of it could fight cancer? Well, interestingly, quite a few of the chemotherapy drugs that we uh, use already, such, uh, drugs such as paclitaxel, uh, the vinca alkaloids, also originated from organisms. They are natural extracts. Uh, this is something uh, we sometimes forget, that many of the drugs that we use uh, originate from mainly land-based organisms. And about 15 years, 20 years ago, people started to think that the majority of the uh, Earth's surface is water, and therefore this was a potential source of other chemicals that may be used to treat cancer. And also started to think that the, the marine environment in, in many ways is a very hostile environment and that potentially the organisms that lived under the sea, for them to be able to survive things like sea sponges, that they would need really quite complex defense mechanisms and therefore that they may harbor potential poisons that we may be able to extract from these organisms and then use in a, in a constructive way. Where is the research now? At the time, it was a phase three trial. Mm, that's right. Where is it today? Well, we, we had a very exciting year, and that uh, it was only just over a year ago that we got the results of the phase three trial. The trial had the name Embrace. Uh, we presented those results at ASCO last year, showing that aribulin was able to prolong survival for these women living with metastatic breast cancer. And that was followed by a publication in the Lancet, a prominent medical journal, uh, just a couple of months ago. And in the meantime, we've had the drug approved by the regulatory authorities uh, in the US, in Europe and also in other countries, I think including Singapore and Switzerland. So really over the last 12 months, things have moved on really apace. Last year, the president of ASCO said that this is potentially a practice-changing drug. Explain that. Well, I, I, I think that's, that, is, that is right. And uh, maybe the way that I can explain it is, is to uh, put uh, Halivan in the context of where I see it being, being used. Um, because these days we have a, a diminishing proportion, but still we have women whose breast cancer comes back where we need to control their disease for as long as possible, 
for many of these women, they don't have disease which is sensitive to hormonal therapy, so we are reliant on chemotherapy. And we have a number of drugs that have got a proven track record, drugs such as the anthracyclines, the taxanes, capecitabine or zoloda, which we know are active in this setting. But for many women, they can respond to these treatments for a while, but then their cancer becomes active again. And when we've exhausted those tried and tested drugs, we haven't up until now had a chemotherapy or other treatment that was of proven benefit. We had a range of drugs which we knew could work in earlier stages of breast cancer that we would often try and hope that they would do some good for these women who were more heavily pretreated but we didn't actually have proof that these drugs were able to prolong survival. And that's where Halivan has, has changed the, the environment and I think become a new standard of care. And this is a chemotherapy agent that is used in combination with a targeted therapy in appropriate cases? It, at the moment, it's used on its own. Um, and, and it's interesting uh, that you, you raise the, the, uh, the concept of the targeted therapies because aribulin is a chemotherapy drug, and I apologize for moving between aribulin and halivan, I know it by both names. Um, so this is a chemotherapy drug, and it works in an interesting way that is the same but different to other chemotherapy drugs. So what it targets are what we call the microtubules within the cell. And that's, if you like, the scaffold that helps the cell divide. It pulls the, the chromosomes apart. And that's the same target that other drugs such as paclitaxel, docetaxel, the vinca alkaloids target. So we know that attacking the microtubules is a good way of treating women with breast cancer. Where aribulin is different is that it targets this molecule, this structure, the microtubule, in a different, much more specific way. And it appears that targeting the, uh, the microtubule in this subtly different way means that it has a different pattern of activity in the laboratory and may be able to work in situations where the drugs that we previously have have not been able to work. What kind of side effects are associated with the compound? Well, as with any, any, I was going to say any chemotherapy, but really any, any uh, treatment of breast cancer, there are some side effects. Um, but these are relatively modest. Um, as clinicians, we often use the term manageable or acceptable, which is um, a bit of an impertinence since it's our patients who should uh, decide how acceptable the side effects are. Um, but having said that, in the, in the context of, of the side effects that we see our patients experiencing with other chemotherapy, therapy drugs, the side effects are really quite modest. Um, aribulin, halivan can affect the blood counts, so we, we do have to warn patients that they may develop infections. But some other side effects that we thought might be a problem, such as a neuropathy, which is tingling and, and in the fingers and toes and sometimes even weakness of the hands or feet, this isn't something that we see with any great frequency. Uh, we do see it in a minority of patients, less than 10% of patients, but by reducing the dose of the drug or delaying the treatment, uh, we, can, we, can allow the, uh, we can allow that to settle down and, and continue the therapy. So unlike some of the, the taxanes like the, where you would experience that? Yes, some of the taxanes and, and some other drugs which also target the microtubules, uh, we've, uh, we've seen that really a substantial uh, proportion of patients get, uh, get nerve damage that can be really quite troublesome. Uh, for aribulin, it's very much a, a small minority of patients who are affected. What about hair loss? Hair loss is, 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 it, it, is, is tricky to know, and you may, you may think that's a strange thing to say, but most of the experience we have with halivan is in treating women who have received many lines of prior chemotherapy. So most of the women who have been treated with halivan have already got hair loss to a greater or lesser extent from their earlier treatment. So we really won't know until we start treating women who have not received previous chemotherapy, who start with a full head of hair. We won't really know until then. Our sense is that it can cause some hair loss, but certainly nothing like as marked as many other drugs, and that quite often women can get some regrowth of their hair whilst they're on halivan. And you may get that answer soon because the goal is to see how effective the drug can now be for an earlier 
stage of, cancer, of breast cancer? That's right. Uh, we, we already have uh, completed a, a accrual to, to a trial, so uh, a, another trial in which women who are, uh, who are slightly less heavily pretreated than in the trial that uh, we presented last year. We ha we've already completed that trial and are, are awaiting the results and the analysis. Um, but they were, they're having seen the really very encouraging results from last year's study, a new generation of trials is now being planned and some of those will certainly look at halivan in women with much earlier stages of the disease. And Professor Twelves, the criteria for a woman getting the drug at an earlier stage, granted it, it's a research study, but what was or would be the criteria for that sort of early stage breast cancer patient, in other words, would she have to um, present a certain way clinically in order to benefit from the drug? Well, uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming months and years, there'll be uh, a program of, of clinical trials for women uh, who have less heavily pretreated disease, and there'll be information on the internet about which centers are running those. For women who are receiving uh, uh, halivan or are interested about halivan in the in the standard setting, uh, the situation in which it's been approved is in women who have received previously treatment with anthracyclines, taxanes, and we're in this situation where uh, there really are few, if any, other options of, of proven benefits. And in the metastatic setting, uh, the early research increased survival it was, I think, two and a half months. But since then you have a bit more research, how is it looking for you know, the landscape for overall survival? Well, what's, what's most encouraging is, is that we are seeing this benefit in survival. Uh, when I was uh, training in breast cancer uh, some 15, 20 years, I should say 20, 25 years ago, I'm afraid, it wasn't at all clear what impact chemotherapy had for prolonging survival. Uh, we were taught that the main aim of chemotherapy was to reduce or prevent symptoms developing, and that was helpful for women, but it really wasn't clear what the impact on survival was. What we've seen over the last 10 years in a limited number of trials is that we clearly can prolong survival for women with metastatic breast cancer. And in this group of women who'd exhausted the tried and tested therapies, as you say, uh, survival was increased from about 10 and a half months to just over 13 months when we presented the data last year. Since then, we've done some further analyses that the regulatory authorities asked for, and that shows that as the data mature, uh, the benefits are becoming more apparent. Uh, the uh, increase in survival is a, li is a little bit more than that, about 2.7 months. Um, but I think what's encouraging is that the data, as the data get more mature, the, the, the results get more encouraging. What we sometimes have seen in the past is promising early results uh, wither away as the data mature, when we look to be seeing quite the opposite. The other uh, analysis that we've done, which I, I think is, is relevant uh, to many of my patients and, and many uh, of uh, people who will be looking at, at this, is that when we looked at the patients who were treated uh, from North America, from Europe and from Australasia, the benefits from aribulin appear to be particularly uh, marked in that group of women uh, where the prolongation of survival was over three months. One of the noted uh, breast physicians said that he feels that this could be the last chemotherapeutic agent being developed for the treatment of breast cancer. What do you say about that? I, th I think uh, it, it's an interesting comment. Um, certainly there are relatively few chemotherapy drugs being uh, developed uh, that have reached the stage of these large phase three trials. Um, whether it will be the last, I, I, I rather doubt. Um, chemotherapy is still at the core, it's still at the foundation of our treatments for, for metastatic breast cancer. Uh, most patients who receive uh, Herceptin, for example, will also be receiving chemotherapy. It's combination therapy. It's combinations. So I, I think we'll continue to see more chemotherapy. I think what we may see emerge over the coming years is, a, is a, a, a breaking down of this distinction between chemotherapy drugs on the one hand and targeted therapies on the other hand. If we use Halivan as an example, we understand very clearly how it works. It targets the microtubule in a very precise way. 
So I think this middle ground where we're developing new chemotherapy drugs, but ones that are targeted in the sense that we're developing them on the, base, on the basis of how we understand what makes the cancer cell tick, means that there may be a new generation of drugs that are, if you like, smart chemotherapy rather than the, uh, the, uh, the less smart drugs that we've, that we've had in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Dr. Christopher Twelves, Head of Experimental Cancer Medicine, the Center at St. James Institute of Oncology, Leeds, United Kingdom. Thank you very much.